Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. All right, well, good morning, VXV Church. He is risen indeed, amen. amen. Great to be here with you this Easter morning, as in any Sunday morning where we celebrate the gospel. If you are new or if you are a guest with us today, we are thrilled that you are here with us. If you don't have a Bible, we want you to walk out of here with one today. Uh, back in that direction, there is our welcome center. Uh, we would love to take, have you take one of those Bibles and consider that our gift to you. Everyone leaves this place with a copy of the Word of God today, okay? Now, that is clapworthy indeed. Uh, we just finished up our study in Hebrews. Uh, we, we've got the anointed section here up front. You guys are going to be fun this morning. Just finished up our study in Hebrews. Next week, we will begin our journey into the gospel of Matthew. And so what perfect timing here that between these two journeys, the Lord lands us here on Easter Sunday. And what a, a sovereign segue uh, this is. We have just finished the Bible's premier work on the supremacy of Christ, and we're going to head into the life and ministry of Christ in Matthew next. And so here we are on Easter, boom, right between these two journeys, getting a preview of coming attractions here, uh, celebrating really the very supremacy of Jesus' earthly ministry, his death and resurrection. You cannot plan these kind of things. You understand that. God is good. Now, um, Let's just get all the cards on the table up front here. Um, we know that on Christmas and Easter, uh, as churches, we tend to have people that will come um, just on those two days. Uh, maybe your wife dragged you in here. Uh, maybe this is uh, your biannual gift to her. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe others of you, I say this every year, all right? Maybe you've driven by. You've seen the massive VXV logo on the building out there, and you thought to yourself now, hey, that, that is very Batman, all right? <laughs> Now, that is a very Batman. Uh, maybe I'll give these guys a shot this Easter. And so, I, man, I'm good with that. It is very Batman, all right? Listen, whatever reason you have for being here, look, I'm good. I'm just thrilled that you're here now. So here's the cards on the table part, and, and this is not popular, but it's biblical. The purpose of the church is not to entertain unbelievers, and so we don't orient our approach uh, to a Sunday service that way here at VXV. There, there are places that you can go to get that. This isn't one of them. Okay. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, Acts chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 10. The primary purpose of the church biblically is to feed and build up and equip a local body of believers to make much of Christ and so delight in him that there would be in them a desire to share the glory that they have so savored, okay? Uh, we, don't, we don't teach Christian behavior here. 
but rather we show you the infinite beauty and excellence and worth and glory of Jesus Christ because you know this, whatever you delight in most, that's where your behavior is going to go. We don't need to teach you that. We just need to show you the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so what I plan to do here today is to strengthen and build up this body of believers and get into a kind of Easter message that is helpful and and compelling versus one that is not. And so if you're visiting with us or if you're newer to the faith or, or, or if you happen to be hunting for a church home, I will not use Easter Sunday as some kind of a vehicle to recruit you or get cute with you or somehow convince you that this is where you should be. That's God's job. What you're going to see and hear today is what we do week in and week out at VXV, and that's get after the glory of God. If, as a visitor, you happen to be compelled uh, by the beauty and perfection of who the Word of God presents Jesus Christ to be today, well, then I should be thrilled with that. Again, man, man, I'm glad you're here. And so turning now uh, to those that call VXV their church home, what would be useful and compelling for us today uh, as we celebrate uh, the the death and resurrection of Christ? Let's start right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. There it is right there. How are we transformed? By beholding the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are transformed not by willpower, not by the energies of the flesh, not by religion, but you and I, we are transformed when we will take these masks of ours off with unveiled face and simply set our gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory. We, we are transformed by not just seeing, but seeing and savoring the glory of Jesus Christ is infinitely superior to all of these other lesser temporal affections competing for the attention of our hearts. Over time, as you continue to behold the glory of the Lord, the, the affections of this world that had, had at one time so gripped your heart, they will begin to lose their shine. That is how we are transformed. Not by religion, not by rules, all right, but by treasuring the beauty and the excellency of Christ as infinitely greater than the inferior things. Again, what you delight in the most, we say this often here, what you delight in the most, that is where the rest of your world's gonna go. That is the simple physics of affection. Now, notice the pace or the rate at which we are transformed here. And and this is what I wanna set in your brain as we begin our study this morning. As we say here often as well, it is the slow work of grace, isn't it? You and I, our being prepared for eternal glory, this is not something that happens all at once or you and I would be toast, all right? The white, hot, blazing glory of our thrice holy God, that that is something that needs to be meted out to you degree by degree, a little bit here, a little bit there, line by line, precept by precept, verse by verse, Isaiah 28, right? Now, one day, those of you who named the name of Christ, one day you will have a glorified body and soul that can withstand the direct presence of God, 1 Corinthians 15. But for now, it is degree by degree by degree, from one degree of glory to another. And so if perchance you've ever wondered why Christian growth is so painfully slow sometimes, it is because God is gentle. All right? It is because he is gentle and measured in meeting out his glory to you. Do you understand? All right. 
And so what we're going to do today, Christians, still talking to believers here, is I am, I am not going to turn your world upside down for Jesus with one Easter sermon, right? I think we all understand that. However, listen to me, if we can move your heart and, and move your affections even one small degree this morning, just one more degree into treasuring the excellence and beauty of his character and his person, then we will have succeeded in my estimation. And so what I intend to do here today uh, is lead you through now um, the final seven things that Jesus had said um, before the resurrection. Okay, we're, we're going to look at the seven final things that Jesus said as he hung on that cross before he died for our sin. And then three days later, of course, was resurrected. Now, um, you, you cannot separate the death and the res uh, resurrection of Christ, which you've heard me mention together three times now, right? You cannot separate them, try though preachers may. What the resurrection does is validate the cross, all right? It validates Jesus, it validates his mission, it validates his deity, it validates his word. The resurrection tells us his payment for our sin took all right, that the check had cleared in our vernacular, that the father was satisfied with his payment for our sin. In short, the resurrection proves that Jesus is who he said he was. Okay? And so what I intend to walk us through today is a celebration of who this man is that we might walk out of here with just one more degree. All right? And so to look at who this man is with the time that we have on one Sunday, okay, I can think of nothing more profitable than to exegete uh, his seven final sayings from the cross, his final words before the resurrection. What, what do you mean exegete? Uh, and, and this is the part we do every week for those of you that are visitors. We're, we're, we're going to study these texts. We're going to consider them. We're going to see them. We're going to savor what they tell us about Jesus, the excellence and beauty of his character. And we're going to consider what they mean for you and I today, what they mean for our joy specifically. Now, we all understand, do we not? If, if you and I, if we value the last words of those loved ones with whom we know their time is short, how much more do you suppose we should value and place particular emphasis upon the very final words of our Lord and Savior and, and what he had to say up there on that cross? How much more should we value his last words. What he said, these last seven sayings, they are pregnant with insight. They are profoundly revealing. And if you will give your heart to what the Spirit has to say this morning, I think you will um, treasure what it is we're going to look at. Now, um, I, I would like to talk for a moment to those unbelieving souls that uh, may be and are in the room this morning. There is a thing or two that I would like you to consider, since in fact you are here today, all right? Now, I don't say this dismissively. I don't say this disrespectfully. Do not hear this condescendingly, all right? Uh, man, again, I, I'm so glad you're here, but what I would ask of you as intelligent human beings is to consider a thing or two as I lead the rest of us through uh, these seven sayings here of Christ. Because whether you like it or not, every human being alive has to make a decision concerning just who this Jesus is. Because when you're dead, it's too late, all right? A tree lies where it falls, Ecclesiastes 11.3. You cannot deny at a very minimum the, the centrality and the significance of this man. The last time you dated a check, you did so by the measure of years since his divine invasion into the history of this planet. Okay? Our calendar marks the number of years since his birth. The best-selling, most published book of all time, it's all about him. More songs have been sung. More 
paintings painted, more biographies written than any other human being in recorded history. You need to decide what to do with this Jesus. And so here's what I want you to consider. Here's what you, uh, unbeliever, and, and I'm, this is not a value judgment, man. I love you. I'm glad you're here. But here's what you must consider because you don't have any other options. Jesus Christ, listen to me now, he is either Lord or lunatic. All right? This is what you must understand. He is either who he said he was or he is an absolute madman because a sane man does not go around claiming over and over to be the living God of the universe manifested in the flesh, which he does repeatedly in the scriptures. Now, what unbelievers will sometimes want to do is they'll concede. Well, I believe he was a good man. I believe he was a good moral teacher. I'll give you that, but I, I just, man, man, I just don't think he was God. But listen, you cannot say that because he did not leave that option open to you, all right? If you have a brain between your ears, if there's gray matter in there, and I know that there is, right, you have to take one of two positions. He is either the Lord or he is a raving lunatic. All right, C.S. Lewis helps us here. Once again, to punish those of you in the rear. <laughs> I am trying here to prevent anyone, C.S. Lewis says, saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. Bless you. That was healthy. Well done. 9.2. <laughs> that is the one thing we must not say. Don't try to improve on that. That's not an invitation. Um, but that is the one thing we must not say. We can't just say he's a good moral teacher. Listen to what he says here. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. This is what I want you to consider, all right? You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come away with any of this patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And so if you don't know Christ, here's what I'm asking you to do since you're an intelligent human being in this building this morning, okay? As we exegete these seven final sayings from the cross, I want you to ask yourself in the quietness of your own heart, does this sound like a lunatic to me? I mean, you, you ask yourself that question. Does this sound like a lunatic? Or, or, or does this sound like love? And then, man, be honest with the answer that comes back to you. Now, for the rest of us, for the family of God here at VXV, I, I, I would say this to you. I think the truest revelation of who a person is, I think you see that when they are under adversity, all right? When somebody is under the gun, you are going to find out what that person is made of. You are going to see their metal. And that's what we're going to discover, the Spirit of God revealing in Christ Jesus here this morning. The truest revelation, the true north revelation we have of the character of Jesus Christ is what we find of him in his death. Okay, so, so believers, here's what we've got this morning, all right? And it's, it's going to be awesome, okay? It is in the death of Jesus... It is here in the death of Jesus that we are given the very greatest lessons on how to live, okay? In his death, we're gonna learn how to live. 
that we might move to great joy just by one degree. All right? One degree this morning. So let's get after it in order. Here is the very first thing that Jesus said from the cross. Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. Here we go. Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. Now this then is the very first thing that Jesus said just after they nailed him to the cross. Isn't it interesting that the scripture records just seven brief sayings from the Savior, right? Bible students, seven, of course, speaks to perfection and completion in the scriptures. So we have a a sort of complete compendium of a, a constellation, a complete constellation of the Lord's glory here just before the resurrection. And each of these utterances is going to reveal to you and I that Christ remained utterly sovereign, totally in control, even in every event surrounding his death. Okay? And so men have rejected Christ now, men have rejected Christ. And there he hangs now, condemned alongside two criminals. That's the scene for this saying here. But the reality is, man's rejection of Christ goes all the way back to the hour of his birth. Does it not? Now, you remember Mary and Joe, right? They're on their way to Bethlehem. Mary's about ready to pop any minute. Can't find any room. Can't find any lodging. We read in Luke chapter 2 that there was... Quote, no room at the inn for him. There was no room for him at the inn. Isn't that interesting? Even at his birth, the word of God is what? Foreshadowing the treatment that he was to receive at the hands of men. There is no room for him at the inn. Men still today make no room in their hearts for Jesus, do they? Now, what, ha- what happened shortly after that? Herod has all the children in Bethlehem, two and under, killed, right? Because he catches wind that the Messiah has been born there according to prophecy. Why does he want Jesus dead? Because he wants to be the Lord of his own life. And he sees this prophecy as a threat. Men don't make room for Jesus because they want to be their own little gods. That's the captivating narrative early on in the Gospels. Still true today. And so again and again, all throughout his life, his enemy sought his destruction. And here now, as we come to the time of the cross, their vile treachery has reached its absolute zenith. To appreciate the weight of this statement, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Here is a, and I wish we had more time, we don't. Here is a very short list of what they have done. And believe it or not, this isn't even close to being fully inclusive. They beat him with closed fists with a bag over his head, a blindfold. They would spit in his face, which in that culture, not that it's a a pleasant expression in today's culture, but particularly emphatic in that culture, that was uh, an expression of, of humiliation. They spit in his face. They beat him with a staff. Over and over on that same um, shrouded head, they stripped him of his clothing. Now, this one is particularly gruesome, and in past Easter's, we've gotten into this, won't do that today, tied him to a post and whipped his back. Now, this was a process called scourging, uh, which you're aware of. They would tie uh, the victim to a post over their head, backs facing the scourgers, all right, and they would be stripped naked, and they would use uh, what would be called a Roman flagellum, uh, also known as a cat of nine tails and this was a leather whip with multiple strands up to nine and in those strands were broken bone fragments pieces of metal lead balls and they would whip these people repeatedly and literally rip the flesh off of their back down into the bones there were times when internal organs were exposed they would wrap around the torso and begin to rip away at the rib cage Uh, as well. Now, there was in Jewish culture a limit to the number of whips that could take place, but this was all thrown out the window at the crucifixion of Christ. Just brutal blood loss there. Uh, 
they twisted a crown of thorns into, into his head. Don't know how many medical professionals we have here, but there is great vascularity uh, around the scalp. This is why head wounds bleed so much. And so they, they twisted this crown of thorns into his head, ripped his beard off his face. Ouch! Okay, I, I can't even imagine the pain, although this year I have a category for that. They crucified him with seven-inch iron spikes. Again, again, don't have a whole lot of time to go into this, but I do want you to understand that it's far more brutal than... Uh, we have sanitized uh, the crucifixion in most of our Easter presentations, but, but they would have the legs to be bent uh, on the cross, and they would drive a five to seven inch iron spike through the feet, it deliberately had them bent so that when the spikes were driven through the wrists, not the hands, because if they, it was through the hands, you'd just fall right off of there, through the wrists, under the ulna uh, there, and there were median nerves that went through that ulna that were specifically targeted. The Romans had perfected the art of inflicting maximum pain and capital punishment. And so what would happen is uh, the, the way the intercostal muscles were positioned and the diaphragm when you were hanging with this bent thing you would sag in order to inhale you had to push up on your feet which of course would um, produce tremendous pain uh, in that spike going through the nerves in your metatarsals and then to exhale uh, inhale and exhale push on your feet then you'd have to let up and hang on your wrists and bam I mean these these median ulnar nerves would just explode and send this pain into your brain utterly um, barbaric, brutal process that he was um, subjected to. Now, uh, Mel Gibson gave us a very graphic portrayal of all of this in his movie, The Passion, which I'm, I'm guessing most of you have seen. Uh, let, let me just bring reality to you. That didn't even come close. Not even close. So brutal. So unspeakably barbaric was this venomous assault on Christ that uh, the prophet Isaiah uh, tells us this in Isaiah chapter 52. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond uh, that of any human being. His farm was marred, uh, his, his form marred beyond human likeness. Now, can you imagine being beaten so badly, so barbarically, so brutally that we, we could barely recognize you as a human being? This is the testimony of the word of God. This, this is unfathomable. Father, forgive them? Now, I don't know about you, but if it were me having endured that, I'm pretty sure I'd be saying, Father, flatten them. All right, Father, crush them, douse them in bourbon, and light them on fire. Flambe them, Father. Fry them. But Jesus, no, no, no. He says, forgive them. He prays for them. In the throes of his agony, he is having compassion upon those responsible for his agony. Who in the world would do that? God manifested in the flesh would. Does this honestly sound to you like the behavior of a lunatic? Of course it doesn't. But it sounds an awful lot like an unspeakably loving, benevolent God whose heart is so crushed by the sins of his children that he would absorb their villainy in order to win them back. That's got to be a degree for somebody, man. Now, I, I, I want to linger here for a minute just to make a point. In Galatians chapter 4, we're told that God sent his son into the world in the fullness of time. That phrase in the Greek, which more, I wish I had more time to unpack the fullness of that, pun intended. But this phrase, pleroma kranos ergomai, it means the perfect time according to his foreknowledge. And so here's what I would have you to treasure. God could have sent his son into the world at any point in history he so chose to whatever people group he chose, right? But he chose to send his son into the world as a Palestinian Jew in the first century under the oppression of the Roman 
empire. Why? Why did he do that? Here's part of the reason. God sent his son in the world to die for our sins in a place and in a time when man had perfected the art of inflicting the maximum amount of pain and capital punishment. Why did he do that? I'll tell you why. When you are a jeweler and you are setting your finest diamonds on display, do you line the display cabinets with newspaper? And cardboard boxes? No, well, you do not do that. Why? Because you would not be presenting your jewels in the best possible light. What would you do? Well, you would find some nice black velvet, right, to magnify the contrast. You would no doubt place some directional lighting in such a way that it would illuminate and, and draw attention to the uh, just the beauty of your jewels. That, that's what you would do. You wouldn't use newspapers, would you? Now, friends, th- this is something like what God has done in sending his crown jewel into the world. his precious son, when and to whom he did, so that the marvelous brilliance of the character of Christ set against the stark black darkness of Roman crucifixion would elevate and magnify and present to humanity in the best possible light the flawless brilliance of his love and his mercy and his forgiveness. Are you getting a hold of this? Stunning sovereignty, brilliant orchestration, maybe that's your degree this morning. Now, Father, forgive them. Why? For they do not know what they are doing. You see, Jesus understood, Romans 3, the wretchedness of the human heart. And so he prays along the line of their greatest need, forgiveness. Right? He knew, Jesus well knew the intellectual, the emotional, the spiritual blindness of the human heart. He was well aware that they knew neither the identity of their victim nor the enormity of their crime. They understood neither, and he knew it. He knew that the only way they could be ushered into the presence of God, the only way that they would know the joy of walking with God is if their sins were wiped out, forgiven. And this is the first great lesson that any human must understand and wrestle to the ground if there is any hope for them. We are all sinners in need of forgiveness. It does not matter if I am highly respected among my peers, if I am still in my sin. It does not matter if uh, what earthly things I may have accomplished or attained to, if I am still in my sin. Listen to me. It is of no use for men to seek noble ideals. It is of no use for men to seek good resolutions. It is of no use for men to develop beautiful character while there remains unforgiven sin between them and God. It is like fitting shoes to feet that are paralyzed or fitting glasses to eyes that are blind. It is eternally irrelevant Sin must be forgiven. Well, how does that happen? Well, the second thing Jesus says from the cross gives us a stunning object lesson in this very thing. He said this, Truly I say to you, in the King Jimmy, verily, verily, I say to you, 77 times we find that expression in the Gospels. 77, complete truth, cool free. That was for free. Truly, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in 
paradise. This was the second thing he said from the cross. Now, if you've spent any time around the church at all, you recognize these words as those which were spoken to one of the two thieves that hung on either side of Jesus upon their own crosses, right? These guys were career criminals about to be executed. Now, one of these criminals, we'll call him the penitent thief, he says to Jesus, in the verse before this, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus saw in this man instantly a saving faith. Well, because he knows all things. And he answers him, all right, today, you, no purgatory here, all right. Today, you will be, there's an immediacy to this. Today, you will be with me in paradise. This particular text deconstructs so many myths, among them the Roman Catholic concept of purgatory, which is utterly unbiblical, all right? So today you will be, like right now, today, paradise. So there's an immediacy expressed in this text. Now, this word for paradise, very interesting. Uh, This is paradisos. This is a Persian word meaning walled garden. Now pay attention, When when a Persian king desire to bestow upon one of his subjects, all right, uh, a, a, a level of honor or a level of reward, he would, this Persian king would invite this person in um, for a private walk in his opulent garden, uh, for a Persian king to bring you into his garden. It was an expression of intimacy, uh, most uh, saliently, uh, an expression of honor, an expression of fellowship. You were the king's honored companion and opulent luxury. And these Persian gardens were opulent. And so this is now what Jesus is expressing to this penitent thief. If you understand this text, it's insane what he's saying here and to whom he's saying it. All right. I'm not just promising you immortality here. Jesus is saying, I am promising you a place of honor and companionship with me in glory. Uh, Do you understand who this is being done to? (laughs) This text is doubling down very dramatically, very deliberately, very intentionally to make an absolute screamer of a point theologically and relationally. Now, Now you think about this. How in the world did this criminal ever even come to trust in Christ? I mean, how did he know? What was there on this particular occasion that is going to convince you that this other guy hanging on the cross next to you is the Christ of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah? Certainly not the circumstances, right? Doesn't appear to be a victor at all. Looks rather like a victim. He's in a state of weakness. He's in a place of public shame. He's been beaten to a bloody mess. The crowd gathered around him. They're mocking him. Hey, why don't you take yourself down from that cross, Mr. Messiah Pants? Right? His friends have left him. His enemies are having their way with him. He is in a position of shame. This scene is entirely inconsistent in every way with the Jewish idea of a Messiah. In fact, Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? The penitent thief speaks to Christ well before any of the supernatural phenomenon that is about to occur, occurs. That might have convinced him that he was God, right? The rocks have yet to split. The earth have yet to, the, the, the earth has, has not quaked. The darkness has not come. The graves have not been opened. The centurion has not said, truly this was the son. Like none of that happened yet. And yet here is this man, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Is that not fascinating? Now notice here, he says several things to Jesus. Number one, he calls him Lord, Greek word kurios, and it means literally supreme in authority. It is translated Lord and God and master in your New Testament, okay? He is literally calling him Lord, okay? 
Number two, he is saying to Jesus, remember me. Greek word meneomai. It's where we get our word memory from. And it means literally, this is interesting, to bear in mind. It means to bear. He's, he's asking him to bear his sin here. In other words, I'm a sinner. I need to be forgiven. Remember me. Meneomai. Bear. Number three, remember me when you come into your king dumb. Right? So here he is acknowledging Jesus as both Lord and now king. Right? And of course, clearly, this man is expressing, is he not? I mean, he's expressing by faith that he knows this is not the end of the rope for Jesus. Right? Right? So we've got a remarkably rich, just robust statement of faith here flowing from a man who has been incarcerated on death row here now in the midst of the most unlikely set of circumstances possible. And yet he sees the sinless son of God who is Lord that will die for his sin and be raised from the dead to return to the father in glory. Now pay attention, here is a guy, didn't go to church, didn't go to Bible study, didn't get baptized. In fact, he is a hardened career criminal, and yet the Spirit of God sovereignly comes and shatters the darkness in this man's heart that he might see and believe who Jesus is. Friends, listen to me, what is this narrative? What, what is the Word of God going way out of its way to communicate here? What, what is the Bible trying to literally scream at us here? Simply this. Salvation is not the work of man at all. Not at all. Not in any sliver of a form. You did nothing. It is all of God. That's what this narrative screams at us. Salvation is the work of God alone in the heart of a man or a woman. And if a man or woman truly understands that they are free. From the religious rat wheel of performance and guilt. That is soulless, Christless crap and has no place in the gospel. And so the Lord decides to dispense with all of that with this wonderful object lesson. The story of the penitent thief, it is a Christ exalting God-glorifying, religious-crushing, performance-busting, in-your-face object lesson of the reality of justification by faith alone, and grace, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, period. And not works. Here it is in black and white. Don't believe me. Be a good Berean. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. Right? It is a gift of God. Got to say it twice because we're stubborn. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Man, you want to get Easter, get that. And so for my unbelieving guests in the room, no value judgment, I love you. I was an unbeliever for the first three decades of my life. No judgment, all right? So my, uh, but again, I, I love you. So, got Christ? No, get him, it's free, I'll throw in the cookies. Okay, uh, there's no bar for you to jump. Okay, there's no hurdle for you to clear. I am praying that the Spirit of God will turn on the lights and shatter the darkness in your heart this morning just as he had done the penitent thief. It's why it's there. It's why it's there. Look, man, does, does this Jesus sound like a lunatic to you? Sure sounds a lot like love, doesn't he? Man, there's no magic prayer, okay? Uh, you just see him and believe. Come and see me, man. I'll help you with that deal. We make things so complicated. Well, come with me and uh, repeat after me. No, man, just shut up. <laughs> just see him and believe. 
Jesus doesn't care what words come out of your mouth like this is some magic incantation. It's what's in here, and he'll open that up for you, all right? We make things so complicated and so convoluted and so difficult, and it's not. It's just not. God's going to open your eyes when he decides to open your eyes in his sight. God's going to open your eyes. You're going to get it. And I pray that that day is today for you. Okay? You'll know. Now, believers, life lessons continue to mount, don't they? Right? Even in the throes of his agonizing pain, like literally breaths from death, he's still forgiven people. Still bringing people to God, right? Even in his death, we are seeing how to live. Is there somebody that you need to forgive? You know who you are. Is there somebody that you need to point to Christ? Is there a degree for you here in this area? All right, number three. Third thing he says from the cross now, we go to John chapter 19. We're going to pick up the pace. Unbelievers, don't worry. I'll have you home by two. All right. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples, so at the foot of the cross, all of this obviously at the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, this would be John, Standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Uh, quickly, and this is for free, he did not call, he called her woman to lessen her pain. You see, he needs to attach her affections to the fact that he's the, her savior and not just her, her earthly son, okay? Because it's going to hurt less for her if her affections are attached to that which is higher. Do you understand that? So that she sees redeeming purpose in this, and that, that's really a whole nother Bible study. I hope I didn't confuse you by throwing that in there. Uh, so woman, behold your son. This is an act of love for him, not disrespect. Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, he said to John, behold your mother. And from that, now again, again, remember, this excruciating crucifixion up and down, pain on these nerves. He's saying these things. Uh, and from that hour, uh, John took her to his own home. Now, now, there was a little band of believers left at the foot of the cross. Everybody else is scattered. But you had Mary, uh, the earthly mother of Jesus. You had the beloved apostle John. And then you had two other Marys. Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Possibly a fourth named Mary, uh, scholars have debated. Uh, I is it not interesting? At a minimum, you've got three Marys at the foot of the cross. Isn't this sovereignty? Three Marys at the foot of the cross. The name Mary comes from the Hebrew Miriam, which means bitter. Indeed, a bitter scene. And so what we've got here is Jesus giving the care of his mother over to the apostle John. He's saying, Mary, John is from now on your son. And then he says to John, John, Mary is now yours to care for. Now understand that what is happening here is Jesus is providing for the needs of his family that's what he's doing. He's making provision for the needs of his family. Understand this as well. If you name the name of Christ, the Bible calls you adopted sons and daughters, right? Adopted sons and daughters. Here's the encouragement here. If Jesus, listen to me now, let, let's argue from the lesser to the greater as Christ himself often did. If Jesus can provide for the needs of his own in his hour of deepest weakness and humiliation, how much more can he provide for your needs in his present position of power and exaltation? The massive profound illustration here, church, is that of Jesus providing for us in the body of Christ by the church. Now, the reason Jesus did not entrust Mary to the care of his half-brothers, the other sons of um, Mary, is because John chapter 7 tells us they weren't believers yet. 
One day they will, but they haven't yet. And so Jesus turns his mother over to the care of, uh, over to the care of the church under John. And therefore, in this new relationship between Mary and John, we have a powerful cross-born illustration of Jesus providing for us with and in and through and by the local church. You remember Jesus... Um, One of my favorite stories, he told the rich young ruler that uh, he had to to sell all that he had if he wanted to follow him. And uh, so, of course, he turns away. And then Peter, Peter, chimes in and says, Jesus, behold, we have left everything to follow you. And then Jesus said something rather amazing in response to that. He said this to Peter. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms, Pete. For my sake or for the gospel's sake, not now watch this, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age. Now our charismatic friends want to hijack this text. Listen to me. A hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, right? Now, the question is, where in the world am I going to receive a hundred mothers and brothers and children right now in the present age? Answer, in the church. In the family of God, when you come to Christ, you are then ushered in to the family of God where he wants to provide for you and nourish you and sustain you and bless you and use you to do all those things for others. Two things that we want to see in this text, okay? Um, Number one, the excellency of Christ. Here is Jesus, again, experiencing the most stupendous agony imaginable, and yet still, like, even in the midst of all this sin bearing, his sympathies are directed to providing for others. Do you understand how shockingly unselfish this is? What you have here, again, friends, is the the purity of his character coming to the surface in the hour of his most intense trial. This is not the heart of a lunatic. This is the heart of the Lord. You cannot miss this. Secondly, again, life lessons. Got Christ? No. Get Christ and you'll have thrown into that the entire family of God. Look, God is providing for you through and in his body, the church, Allow yourself to know other people. Allow yourself to be known. Jesus gave unto us one another in order that we might be a blessing to one another and be blessed by one another. Man, man, you unplug from that. You're just depriving yourself of, of one of God's primary means of providing for you. All right? And you will be the poorer for it. John 15, 5, these things I say to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. You cannot come into the fullness of joy that God has for you apart from the body, getting plugged into the body he sovereignly placed you in. True story. This is a degree that still awaits so many of you here this morning. All right, number four, Now, this is a very tough saying to grab, but filled with insight and power here. Fourth thing he says from the cross is this. Matthew chapter 27. About the ninth hour, so there had been three hours of darkness now at this time. Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. What does that mean? That is... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is troubled people. This is profound. This is a remarkable text worthy of its entire own sermon. All right, but, but what I want you to grab here, I'm just going to give you the highlight reel. The primary meaning for you and I is this. This, this is telling you and I that Jesus understood the weight. All right, like Jesus understood the weight and the seriousness of sin. 
Okay? This is telling us that Jesus despised and resented and hated the implications of sin. And all of this is set against the backdrop of remarkable eternal intimacy here. Now, I I need you to engage your brain and think with me a little bit here this morning if you're going to grab this. You see, sin could do here, and listen to me very carefully, sin was able to do here what nothing else in the universe could. Men could not separate the Father from the Son. Demons could not separate the Father from the Son. Satan himself could not separate the Father from the Son. But sin separated the Father from the Son. Listen to me. Sin is the most devastating reality in the universe because it separates us from God. And Jesus is now in the full throes of experiencing the full force of this. All right, now, there are those that want to say, oh, he's just quoting Psalm 22. No, all right, Jesus doesn't feel abandoned here. There's all kinds of uh, liberal, um, soft, pseudo-Christian explanations for this text. Listen, because here's what's happening at the cross, all right? God was punishing his own son as if he had committed every deed done by every wicked sinner who would ever believe. And he did it so he could forgive and treat, tra- and treat saved sinners as if they had lived perfectly righteous lives like Christ. That's what happened at the cross. Scripture teaches this explicitly. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. Do you you understand what that would mean? Like the the weight of an elephant standing upon your chest would barely communicate the galactic weight of crushing sin that was laid upon our Savior. To be sin on our behalf so that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. I'll say it again. Most believers know half their salvation. That's it. They know that their sin's gone. They do not know that they have the perfect righteousness of Christ put on them. If you are a believer, you are walking around with perfect obedience. Do you understand that? Positionally. Gosh, I wish, I'm keeping you here till three. Too bad. (laughs) You need to know this. Let's get back on track, Johnny. All right. So he is agonizing here in the hour of his greatest trial because he is, now listen, he is about to experience, believe it or not, something far worse and far more severe than the physical brutality he suffered. He's going to be separated from his father in some dimension of time. We have, we just have no, we will never understand it. This is the climax of his suffering. And it's why he's crying out what he's crying out. We will never understand the full force of his separation from the Father this side of the resurrection. We're just not equipped to understand that. One day we will, 1 Corinthians 12. But at present, we cannot fathom what it would be like to be separated from the one to whom you have been, listen, eternally enjoined. Now we get a small taste of this in death, don't we? You've known somebody for 10 years, they die, man, that hurts. Bad. You know someone for 20 years and they die? Well, well, that stings a little more, doesn't it? What about losing a spouse to whom you've been enjoined for 50, 60 years? Well, that hurts even more. There is no more painful experience than this life can throw at us than the death of a loved one. And it is exacerbated by, compounded by, made worse by the time that we've known them and enjoyed them and fellowship with them. So riddle me this. Do we understand that Jesus has been in eternal intimate fellowship with his Father? Not for 40 years, not for 50 years, not for 60 years, not for 2,060 years, but for all of eternity! beyond the corridors and councils of time itself. What would that feel like? I don't know, but Jesus did. That's a degree for me. What he did for you and I is unspeakable. There are no words. 
that sound like a lunatic to you? Sounds a lot like the Lord. All right. Fifth and sixth things Jesus said up there, they come very close to one another in John chapter 19. Let's go there. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine up upon, uh, upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to his mouth. And therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, here's the sixth thing he said, it is finished. Now back to statement five there. I, I don't think that the fifth saying, and I could be wrong, I, I don't believe it to be a particularly spiritual one, all right? Uh, now, it is true, he is fulfilling prophecy here, Psalm 69, 21. Every one of these seven statements, by the way, is fulfilling prophecy, and that just goes to the staggering sovereign control he has over this whole process. This is all going completely to script, and that's another Bible study. But having said that, again, I don't think this is a particularly theological statement here. I simply think that our Savior is thirsty, all right? He's been beaten to within an inch of his life in the hot eastern sun, Right? There's been tons of blood loss, lost fluids. He is thirsty because he has two profound things yet to utter from that cross for which he is going to need a drink. Now, the sixth thing that he says here is profoundly theological, and he says it is finished. Now, uh, this, the one, one Greek word for that phrase, this is a tetelestai. It is a financial term. It came out of their world of accounting, all right? And, and it means to discharge a debt. Tetelestai means paid in full, all right? Now, in, in this culture, if you owed a particular debt, you would make your periodic payments, much as we do today, right? But when you made that final payment, they would write the word tetelestai over your ledger, all right? You had discharged your debt. You had paid in full. This is what Jesus is saying he has done for the debt of human sin, Okay? He has completed the work he was sent to do. He has paid the price for our sin. The Father was satisfied. How do we know? Again, the resurrection. Jesus knows that's going to happen, so he can say, and, and by the way, Mark tells us in his gospel, Jesus did so very loudly, probably why he needed a drink, right? But Jesus screams out at the top of his voice, it is finished. He, he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished finished. What's it? The work of salvation. Now look, Christian, listen very carefully. Because man, we start out getting this and then somewhere down the line we swerve right back into works. It's dumb. All right, listen. You cannot add to what Jesus has done. All right? Do you understand that? All that was necessary for your salvation is finished. Don't swerve back into that, man. Uh, like uh, All the heavy lifting is done. Pay attention now. You are as positionally righteous before God as you are ever going to be. You are vertically, positionally as... Again, you've got his obedience on you. You are as positionally righteous as you're ever going to be. Now, practically, horizontally, boy, I could be a whole lot more righteous, couldn't I? So could you. The rest of your natural life, and we call this sanctification, is your practical holiness catching up with your positional holiness. Are you hearing that? Your practical holiness is eventually going to catch up in, with your positional holiness in glory. But here, it's degree by degree. You walking in practically what's already yours positionally, okay? And the more you catch up with your position, the more your practical righteousness catches up with your positional righteousness, the more of the joy and the peace of God are going to be experienced by you now. Listen to me. You can... You can be holy because you are. Do you understand that? 
That's resurrection power. That's the spirit of Easter. Be holy because you are. That's the beautiful paradox because of the resurrection power that lives in you. God is calling you to be who you are. He's calling you to be practically what you are positionally so you can have his joy and have it to the full. All right, number seven right here. Here's the final words to Jesus on the cross. They are these. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, you may think this is just a simple goodbye. It's not. These are not simple parting words. Again, all of this is the script. He, he's quoting Psalm 31 and verse 5 here. And right down to his last breath, Jesus is playing out the script that had been laid by he and his father from the foundation of time. Man, read Isaiah chapter 53. You want some homework this week. What you must understand about the Lord Jesus Christ is his absolute, utter sovereignty in all Things Again, the scripture here is explicit. Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, by him, for him, through him were made all things. In him, all things hold together. Again, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1. Now, now notice here, he doesn't say, um, well, no, no, notice what he does say. I commit my spirit. I do. All right, you Jews and Romans, you didn't do this. I allowed this to play out exactly as the Father and I had scripted it. Now, normally, victims of crucifixion would die much slower deaths. But here, Christ now, being in absolute control, chose himself to yield his soul into your hands, Father. I commit my spirit. He was very explicit about this as well in John chapter 10. Can I remind you? I lay down my life. Nobody takes it from me. Right? I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. Who do you think is in control here? All right? I Notice the Holy Spirit, the repetition of these personal pronouns that just drill this into our stubborn brains. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. Jesus is in control. Don't you dare miss that. Now, my question for you is this, believer, and this is a big one for you, believers. All right? Is your life steadied by the sovereignty of God? Are you steadied are you steadied by his sovereignty? Or do you look at your life as a series of detached events and random coincidences? Do you look at difficulties that come into your life as pointless hassles and heartaches and horrors? And do you see God as this passive observer somehow responding and reacting to things that happen in your life that he has no control over that are somehow outside of his domain because man I'll just love you well here that is completely antithetical to the scriptures not even close and brother or sister until you understand the doctrine of his control and his sovereignty you are getting robbed of just the exceptional rest and provision and peace that you can have in Christ when you simply understand the doctrine of God's sovereign provision over your life. Listen to me. And if you, if you struggle with this, go and get our lessons in Romans chapter 8 and the first three lessons in Hebrews chapter 12. But listen to me. Uh, both in our joys and our sorrows. In our joys and our sorrows, God is working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Philippians 2, Hebrews 13, right? And so when we say, Christian, do, do, like, believe it or not, right? Like, it, when we say, do we believe what the word of God tells us? When we say that we know that God causes all things to work for our good, like, 
Can we believe that, believer? You can believe this. You should believe this. So you can turn your pointless to purpose. Read the rest of Romans chapter 8. Man, you can't miss this. Listen, listen. Is, here's what I want you to challenge yourself with. And then, man, come and see me. I want to help you with this degree. I'll help you all day long with this. Is your life steadied by the sovereignty of God? All right. Let's land the plane and bring this all to a summary. Let's bring it all to a head. So Jesus lived a perfect life and he died a perfect death. In the hour of his greatest trial, the truest expression of his perfection was manifested. He lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death. And because of that, the Bible says God did something, and that's why we're gathered here today, right? Do you know what it says God did? God raised him from the dead. Twelve times in the book of Acts, it says that alone, right? When Jesus said to Telestai, when he screamed, it is finished, when he paid in full, when he, he screamed it, declared it, proclaimed it, meant it. He meant it. And when God raised him from the dead, why we're here today, what does that tell you that the payment took? Again, the check did not bounce. It cleared. The resurrection is the Father's affirmation that our sin has been dealt with and put away. But that's just the half of it. The perfect obedience is on you. The resurrection is the evidence that the bill has been paid in full for those who are in Christ, if it wasn't paid in full, do you understand he would still be in the ground? Right? But he is not. The tomb is empty. That is Easter. So, so here's what we've got. And I'll just love you well and be honest. If you don't have Christ, you can be mad at me. I'm okay with that, man. The stakes are too high. Okay? If you do not believe on Christ this morning, it is because you have not examined him, period. When you ask unbelieving individuals if they've ever made their own personal investigation into Christ, the overwhelming majority of the time, if they're being honest, will say, no, I have not. What I'm telling you is, look, if after spending, and we haven't, we, we've scratched the surface today, man, you've got to do your own investigation. If after spending an earnest effort empirically examining the life and claims of Christ, if after doing that, you're going to take the position that this man was a lunatic, I'm saying you're intellectually and morally impoverished. Now, that's not a value judgment. I'm saying Make that investigation. Do that investigation. Eternity hangs in the balance, and I don't want to see you separated from God. And don't do that. Pro problem is most of us don't take the time to examine him. This was no lunatic. This was and is and will always be the Lord of the universe. Now, if you're not a believer, Understand, you're still in God's story. But if you remain in your sin, your part in that story will be to display God's justice. I don't think you want that. You're still in God's story. You're just going to display his justice instead of his mercy. And I am also convinced, if you have not Christ this morning, that you are here on purpose because I have a very high view of God's sovereignty because that's what that book says. And so I believe this is divine appointment for you. This can and should be your hour where the invitation to you is, Behold, your mother and brothers and sisters. Come to me. And the entire family of God will be thrown in. And we'll pray for you in a minute. Now, for the rest of us, oh, what a glorious morning to celebrate. 
I pray that you would continue to see and savor and be deeply satisfied by this constellation of excellencies and beauty and glories in Jesus Christ, that you would continue to grow in your delight in him degree by degree by degree from glory to glory. Amen. This Easter morning in the year of our Lord, 2021, the Lord has taught us that we can learn to live by the way that he died. Forgive others, believers. Bring others to Christ. Know and be known in the body of Christ. Be holy because you are holy. Rest in the finished work of Christ. Be steadied by his sovereignty, and the fullness of joy can be yours. This isn't what you do to get Christ, believer. You already have him. This is what you do to get joy. Listen to me. The more your life is about him and the less it is about you, the more joy and energy and vitality and life there is to be had. Because what you delight in most, what you elevate the most, that is where the rest of your world is going to go. I pray we've fed that delight today. And if we have moved your heart just one degree over to glory, then I am praising God for that degree. Happy Easter, guys. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your word and your son so beautiful, so glorious. Oh, may none of this power of yours be weakened by the flawed nature of this dumb vessel. Lord, you're so good. I just pray that your spirit and your spirit alone, that your glory would be made known to the hearts of these men and women this morning. I pray, God, that you would just bless their socks off. I cannot give you counsel. You are too high for me. I don't even understand these things. All I know is what you have shared with us in your word. You love us unspeakably. You have joy for us unfathomably. If we would just simply believe. So God, I I pray for those in this room that do not know you, that this would be the day or the week or the month that, that Lord, you would decide not to flip that switch. It is only... By, by your um, revealing yourself to them that they will come. I, I pray that they would be today for many. And for my brothers and sisters, I, I just pray you would prepare us for this amazing journey we've got coming up in Matthew. I pray they'd get excited about that, Lord. This is going to be a great year in this body of, of us glorifying you together. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Happy Easter. He is risen. Let's worship.